Thanks for having me here. And we're going to look at a dramatic presentation uh, to start our talk. This is a 12-year-old, 120-pound child. I'm sure you all have kids like that in your practice. He was hurt in gym. He was going under a rope. They were playing limbo. And they had to call EMS, who strapped him to a board, brought him to the emergency room here. And the question was, what are we looking at? Does this kid have a hip fracture, a femur fracture? This is a low velocity injury. So what we ended up having was a femur fracture. And you can see the, um, the femur is fractured and embedded in the muscle, in fact. And it was almost like a yoga move to reduce this and to um, then go ahead and uh, take him to the operating room where he had a rod put in. He's 120 pounds, so he's too big for a lot of the hardware. This particular instrument is good for a patient this big, and we were careful to avoid his growth plates. He, in fact, was worked up for a low bone for um, the low velocity injury, and his vitamin D was found to be 10. So he was treated for his low vitamin D. Now we'll start with patient number one. This is a 14 plus four year old who was injured during basketball warm up. He felt, heard a crack. Immediately he had tenderness and swelling. His knee was in slight flexion, he could not move it at all. So if you look at this x-ray, you can see that he has a fracture at the tibia tuberosity. You really don't see anything on the AP x-ray. Uh, he was taken to the operating room emergently because he was getting a lot of swelling in the area. And um, he had an ORIF, a couple screws placed. He, in fact, pulled his patella tendon off, which was fixed as well with a suture anchor. And after three months, he was back to full activity with full motion. This, is, this tibia tuberosity uh, fracture um, was caused, but can be caused by either violent contraction of the quad during extension, so when they're actually jumping, they pull it off, or when they're landing, the contraction of the quads or the landing inflection pulls this piece of tibia tuberosity off, and there are different extents to the amount that it can be pulled off. And as you all remember, I'm sure this is the area where you would have your Osgood-Schlatter growing pains type issues. This is not related to that. This happens in males, 13 to 16 years of age for the most part. And you can have associated injuries. Uh, but, and you can have complications with the biggest problem being compartment syndrome. This, per, this particular injury should not be held over for the next day. This should be taken care of pretty immediately. And in fact, this uh, patient had a lot of blood collecting in his calf muscles um, at the time of surgery, even though it was pretty quickly. Um, when it's non-displaced, you can treat it in a cast, if it's, um, or uh, sometimes you can put a knee immobilizer on if it's really very minor. And um, we wrote a paper out of here looking at a series of these um, kids that have very low vitamin Ds. To pull that big piece of chunk off, a bone off, you know, uh, these kids tended to have a low vitamin D. So let's look at a uh, pearl when you're looking at knee injuries in children. If you have a nine-year-old boy who's tackled during football and has a swollen tender knee and he's unable to bear weight and the x-rays don't show anything, so what kind of injury does he have? Does he have a ligamentous injury? Or does he have a physeal injury? And you really need to examine the child. The younger the child is, the more common that it will be the physis that will give and he'll be swollen all the way around the femur and in fact, this will have to be watched in the future to, for a growth arrest, but you could also have a ligamentous injury. So now we'll move on to patient number two. This is a 13-year-old obese boy with no complaints. Mom complains he has a right-sided limp, and he reports a knee injury three months ago and refers to this as, as his bad knee. So we're going to go through this quickly because this was actually covered before um, and um, is a patient who, when he flexes his knee, and you've seen this picture, he rotates um, externally, um, externally. So, and he has a right-sided Trendelenburg limb. And in fact, we were supposed to take this out of the uh, session, so I think this is the wrong set of slides, but that's okay. 
So um, just to review again, um, a patient complaining about knee pain, you need to check the hips as well. And the knee is normal in this patient, even though he thinks he has a knee problem. He, in fact, has a hip problem. And this is a problem found in boys more often than girls. And do not get tunnel vision just because somebody's complaining about knee pain. As uh, Dr. Strasberg pointed out, we have stable and unstable patients with slip capital femoral epiphysis. Those that are stable are urgent to fix. Those that are unstable are emergent to fix and are more likely to have avascular necrosis of the hip. Now we'll move on to patient number three. This is a four-year-old boy who was on the trampoline with mom. And as mom's going up, he's coming down, and he starts crying, limping, hopping on the other leg. Um, he can move his knee. There's no swelling there. And physical exam shows that he's tender to palpation at the proximal tibia. So what would you do next? So this is pretty classic. And an x-ray of the knee is read as negative. But if you look closely, you actually can see a little buckle here. But sometimes you actually don't see it. Um, based on his history, and we've emphasized that history is very important, he has a classic trampoline fracture. There's a proximal tibia buckle fracture, and he can be treated um, in, in a, you know, a knee immobilizer or a cast for an occult tibia fracture based on his clinical exam. And what is the complication of this proximal tibia fracture? This is very important to warn patients that this may happen. Um, there's something called a Cozen fracture where after this heals, and at this point three weeks later you can actually see where the fracture was, uh, this may grow into valgus. And I've had patients show up in my office and say, hey, I don't know what happened. Look, you know, my child's growing into valgus here, and in fact they had had a uh, tibia fracture. And this can be seen even with a minor buckle fracture in the children that are age two to eight. And it mostly corrects on its own, but may need some guided growth. This is an example of a patient who has some mild knock knee normally, and then you see what happened when the patient um, had this fracture. And so if this does not correct on its own, or if you see this, this is worth sending to the orthopedist, and we'll either watch it or we'll offer some correction. Patient number four is a four-year-old boy who was injured going down the slide with dad when his leg caught under him and under dad's leg. So dad's feeling really bad about this. And physical exam shows the patient is crying. He's unable to stand. He's got minimal swelling of the leg, but he's tender at the leg. And then if you look at the x-ray, you, you, you see a um, spiral fracture of the, ex, of the tibia. Um, and this is due to torsional force. Um, you can get this from the leg being caught under dad or you know, if the leg got caught in the crib and twisted. And this heals without any future problems. And then um, patient number five is a patient who's a 16-year-old basketball player with an acute ankle injury. So you see how he's got his ankle internally rotated. Um, he's swollen, he's tender, he can't bear weight, and um, we get a fr an, um, an x-ray like this. So this x-ray doesn't look too bad. You look at it and you go, well, there's a little crack there. But, you know, like many other things in pediatrics, this may be the tip of the iceberg, and you really do need more imaging to evaluate this better. And in fact, this is what we call a triplane fracture, or a talo fracture. And it's a three-dimensional fracture. And by looking at a two-dimensional x-ray, you don't appreciate how widened the fracture is at the growth plate. And you don't want to accept too much displacement because then you will um, certainly have a problem, especially at the joint surface. Um, in the younger kids, you also need to worry about displacement at the growth plate itself. These tend to occur, luckily, in patients as they are reaching maturity. So the fact that they've got displacement at the growth plate isn't the issue. We're really more interested in what's happening at the joint surface. If there's too much displacement, then we put a screw across it. Um, one thing not to miss when you're evaluating the ankle is a talus injury. So you look at the medial malleolus, you look at the lateral malleolus, you palpate the, t the talus. And 
many patients are going to have some pain in that area, and depending on how much is there, you need to consider that they may have an osteochondral defect, they may actually have a talus fracture. The blood supply to the talus is poor, which means that you, know, you really don't want to accept, um, you, you want to be very careful as far as uh, missing a fracture is concerned. And it can be hard for them to heal an osteochondral um, defect or lesion. Um, these patients uh, can be treated in a cam boot, uh, but because the talus is injured, they cannot dorsiflex. So to make the cam boot work, what you do is you put some heel cushions under the heel to give them a high heel, so their foot is in equinus in the cast boot, and that way you unweight the area of the talus that's injured, and then you don't have to put them on crutches because they're not walking on that area anyway. And I try to keep as many patients off of crutches as I can because they're pretty dangerous. Some kids do well with them, but a lot of them do not. Now we're going to talk about non-accidental trauma. We really don't want to be missing any of this. There are 4 million abused children per year, 2,000 die of abuse per year. The shaken baby syndrome is when the baby's held by the torso and shaken and can result in rib fractures, intracranial injury, and whiplash of the legs will give you repeated microfracture causing bucket handle corner fractures in the metaphysis of the bone um, due to the bone being avulged from the shear force. 50% of abused children have this fracture, so this is pathognomonic for child abuse. It's frequently bilateral. 10% of children that are less than five years old that come to the ED are child abused. 65% of those children that have abuse do go to the emergency room. So this is a very difficult task for emergency doctors. They really have to keep their eyes open. 31% of head injuries are initially missed. Abuse is, mess, um, is estimated to recur in 30 to 50% of those left unreported. 5% of these will result in death. So we really don't want to miss them. Child abuse is most common in infants and toddlers. 68% of them are less than two years of age. It's these um, these children are demanding, defenseless, and nonverbal. The risk factors for those that will be abused are lower socioeconomic status, firstborn, unplanned or premature birth, stepchild, multiple births, or special needs. The abuser is usually younger aged, single, drug abuser, parent who was abused or unemployed. Imaging recommendations for those under five years of age is to do a skeletal survey. Between zero and 12 months of age, a follow-up skeletal survey two weeks later may be helpful. Between 12 and two years of age, you may need some scintigraphy to back this up, a bone scan. And between two and five years of age, you may want some scintigraphy um, as well. When the patients are older than five, they should be able to point out where they're having pain, which is more helpful for directed um, radiographs. Specificity of injuries for child abuse. Well, those that are highly specific would be the classic metaphyseal lesions. Um, multiple rib fractures, scapula fractures, sternal fractures, spinous process. Moderate um, specificity would be multiple fractures, fractures in various healing stages. Um, as well as some others. Low specificity, although we look at long bone shaft fractures as being possible child abuse, these are actually low specific specificity compared to others. And when I have a patient, you know, and I almost often see, um, you know, a femur fracture and say a two-year-old that's happened at home or some sort of upper extremity fracture and a, a six-month-old, if the story doesn't sound right, or if it was unwitnessed, then I need to talk to the pediatrician. I need to look the parents in the face and say, sorry, we have to get social services involved. I don't know you. Um, but we have to do our job not to miss anything. Here are some x-rays that show a three-month-old with postromedial rib fractures. Uh, and you can see where the arrows are. They're showing you some posterior rib fractures. This is a 12-day-old who was a footling presentation and had a bucket handle fracture from delivery, so not child abuse, 
And look at the massive callus reaction you get when you pull the growth plate of the distal femur away from the bone. This, a, this is a four-month-old who's healing a femoral um, corner fracture, has a little tibia corner fracture, and you see the periosteal reaction here. And this one's new. Um, this is a two-month-old who had a little tibia corner fracture, and then you can see it healing. The differential diagnosis um, would include accidental injury, um, coagulopathies for an intracranial bleed, osteogenesis imperfecta. We know a lot of the genetics that's behind this, but not all of this, so if we suspect this, we can look for it. Menke's disease, um, metaphyseal dysplasia, physiologic new bone formation. So these are things that just happen that may look like that. Rickets, it's important to consider. Kathy's disease where they get these extreme periosteal reaction along the bones, but it will be more than one bone. Um, and um, sometimes we're asked to actually put an age to fractures, and uh, maybe some of my other pediatric orthopedic colleagues have gone to court for this, but I know I have, and they show you an x-ray and say, when do you think this happened? So you need to have an idea that basically by four to 10 days, the soft tissue swelling starts to go away. 10 to 14 days, you get this subperiosteal new bone formation. 14 to 21 days for immature soft callus and loss of fra fracture line defini definition. By more than 21 days, you have a mature or hard callus. And the callus may be delayed if the baby is osteopenic, with poor nutrition, vitamin D, a calcium deficiency. And these sort of are sliding. Like if this is a new baby, you're going to get these reactions and you're going to have the uh, bones heal much quicker. And um, I was going to review ankle fractures, but I don't have that slide, so I apologize. Any questions? <laughs>